Hello and welcome to People's Voice, where true stories touch deep emotions. Today, we delve into my worst vacation and the worst cheating experience. Come, let's explore these real life stories. My name is Brad, not my real name. I've wanted to share this story for a long time. Now that I'm in a long term relationship and I've fully gotten over it, I hope this will help those struggling with mental health or who are struggling with psychological trauma that comes from rejection and cheating from a partner. This happened in 2006. It was my first year in college. I felt isolated and alone and struggled with severe depression. The college I went to had three semesters rather than the standard two. We had a long Christmas break that went from Thanksgiving to the middle of January. When I went home for break, I met a girl through one of my close female friends. Her name was Lauren, a horticulture major. She was petite and fit and shapely. This happened about 15 years ago when I was in college. It's one of those cheating stories that had a devastating impact on me personally and made me very distrustful in relationships, fearful of being emotionally intimate and vulnerable with other people. To begin with, my first year of college was a roller coaster. Very wild swings, wild fluctuations in highs and lows in my emotional state. When I went home for Christmas break, I met a girl from my hometown, or I should say, not far from a hometown I knew her through friends and acquaintances. She was very attractive and interesting. She used to be a long distance runner and had a great body. She was fun to be around. She was in a long term relationship at the time with a guy named Adam. During the break, everyone hung out at one or two people's houses, the party houses, places where the door was always unlocked, where people went in and out and kind of dabbled in psychoactive substances. On New Year's, before she left for a semester to go study in Hawaii, we were intimate. I had only recently learned through one of my female friends that Lauren was into me. I was surprised. She was a little bit older, but very attractive, the girl that everyone wants to sleep with. So that night, when we were intimated, it was amazing. The next week, she went to Hawaii, and I drove seven hours back to my college not far from Chicago. The next semester was rough. My substance use issues were out of control. I thought by ignoring it, it would go away. Even though I did fairly well in school, I wasn't happy. I had few friends or people to talk to, but one thing I did enjoy was talking to Lauren. There were probably signs from the beginning that I was more into her than she was into me, but like my personal addictions, my natural impulse was to ignore them. I didn't know where the relationship was headed, but I took it as a good sign she invited me to Hawaii during spring break. For several months, we talked on the phone. It helped me get through a rough semester. When spring break came, I was mentally and physically exhausted. I took too many hours, overextended myself, and realized only after the fact that I shouldn't have gone on this trip because of my fear of flying. I took a combination of Clonopin, Xanax, and Ambien. I might as well have been anesthetized from the three connecting flights, ten hours in the air. I remembered the initial departure from Chicago to Dallas-Fort Worth because an older Asian gentleman commented after the flight, Wow, I've never seen anyone sleep like that on a plane. I thought, you'd be surprised what a reckless lifestyle can do when you don't care about your health, but instead, I politely nodded my head, about the only thing I was capable of anyway. By the time I arrived in Dallas-Fort Worth, I was about as crisp as someone that had just left a dentist's office after having their wisdom teeth removed. In my memory, the airport, which I know for sure was in Texas, had a shuttle system that at the time seemed impossible to decipher. I barely made my connecting flight and was so incapacitated that I tripped while boarding the plane. I tried to calm everyone down by exclaiming, oops, tripped on my shoelaces. I didn't realize until I got into my seat that I had on slip-ons with no laces. Clearly, things were not breaking my way. In retrospect, I gave Lauren a lot of reasons to cheat on me. I probably would have cheated on me at that time in college. The only time I looked at myself in the mirror was in the bathroom, which had one mirror that only captures you from the neck above. When Lauren picked me up from the airport, I was a mess. 
When we got to her dorm, there was a long hallway with a full-length mirror that you couldn't avoid. It was then that I wished I had done some self-care during the semester. In the full-length mirror, I caught a glimpse of myself and thought, Jesus, you look as good as an obese man who just torched himself in a kitchen fire. Also, my hair, which was naturally thick and curly, looked like someone had glued hay to my hair, or given me poorly manufactured clown hair made of cheap plastics. A lot of people that look terrible will say there was a moment, maybe a photo, that made them so repulsed by their physical appearance that they decided to change their lives. This would have been one of those moments for me. Unfortunately, the months apart had led her to look even better. She was now tan, thinner, seemingly in a healthier mental state too. Going down the hall, I wish I could say we looked like Beauty and the Beast, but the Beast looked much better than me. I was more like Quasimodo. The first night we fell into our old routine. There was a house where everyone hung out. It was about a three-mile walk to get there. I had been living outside Chicago, so it had been in a climate where temperatures had rarely reached above 50 degrees. In Hawaii, while it was probably 70 or 80 degrees, my perception on the walk was it was 4,000. Also, the uppers didn't help. The combination of no exercise, heavy substance abuse, and my body acclimated to a climate where it mostly snowed, caused me to sweat bullets, feeling tired by the time we arrived, and most of the walk was uphill. Things at the party were fine. I relaxed after a while, I got some alcohol into me. I was also pretty decent at talking, coming across as fun, or at least vaguely interesting. When we got back to our dorm, I realized that her mattress was a twin. The wall unit in her dorm mimicked air conditioning but just performed none of its functions. I made my move on her the first night and got rejected. She said something about her period, although this would later turn out to be a lie. Around 4 or 5 a.m., I decided to take a shower to cool off. Being 19 at the time, I didn't know some pretty rudimentary things like washing your hair multiple times draws it out and it's generally bad for it, but I kept showering up mostly because I hate the feeling of damp skin. Plus, I couldn't sleep. The air was thick and humid, and everything stuck to my body. I couldn't sleep. This contributed to its own madness. Can someone go mad from humidity, from heat? What about if we add in sleep deprivation? Somehow, the second day, I looked even worse, I felt even worse. Also, it was hotter inside the dorm than outside, so while she finished her last classes for that semester, I read outside for most of the day underneath the sun, hardly comprehending anything other than a general feeling of self-hatred. She got back and was ecstatic. I thought about how I wished I was somewhere in Siberia where I could cool down in a climate where it was below freezing, and I could wrap up in many layers. Nothing was going well. To celebrate, she insisted there was going to be a big party at the house. We went to the night before. I pretended to be pumped even though my ideal vacation at this point would have been to be placed in a two-week coma in a nice, cold hospital where I could get some real rest and relaxation. Before we went to the party, some handsome German guy who struck me as evil came by with a Ziploc bag of psychedelic mushrooms. For whatever reason, my psychedelic experiences are 50-50 either fun or about as tormenting as finding yourself alone with Twisty the homicidal clown from American Horror Story. This night turned out to be the latter. I felt like Dante being led by Virgil through the nine circles of hell. All of this was before we left for the party, and arguably, this was the best part of the evening. So, let's fast forward an hour or two later. I couldn't find Lauren at the party. She was completely gone. Now, I'm in the phase of severe hallucinations, surrounded by strangers. I don't like small talk, and people were asking me invasive questions like, What's your name? What do you do? Where are you from? Didn't they know I was being punished for eternity, right here, sitting alone in this room, trying to make small talk? Once again, I figured if I could just reach the bathroom and sprinkle some cold water on my face, and avoid looking into the mirror, I could get a grip on myself. But this house had one bathroom, 
and there were about 90 people there for all of them to share. I waited in line in the hallway with the others for a while, and I kept asking whether they've seen Lauren. They said no, or some said yes, but then pointed to a different Lauren. Before I could get into the bathroom to get some cold water, someone said yes, and then pointed to the end of a the hallway. They added, but you may not want to go in there. That person then laughed. I decided to disregard the advice. I needed to see someone I knew, just to tell me that everything was okay. I walked down the hall and opened the door, and the German dude and Lauren were completely naked. She had her legs behind her head, and he was going to town on her. I don't know if I stood there for five seconds or five hours, but it felt like I was frozen in time. I thought I was hallucinating. I know I was hallucinating one thing, that the German guy had transformed into an SS soldier. The bed was turned in such a way where she couldn't see me, but he could. He smiled as he finished. She turned around and told me to shut the door. It was all real, except for the fact that I imagined the German guy was the reincarnation of an SS soldier. Somehow, I made it back to her place, got my things, and started walking to a hotel. When I looked at my wallet, I noticed that someone had taken most of my cash, so I had to use a credit card that was pretty close to the limit. I stayed at a hotel for a night, but I barely got any rest, just replaying the whole evening in my head. The next morning, I realized I could not stay at the hotel again because my credit card would exceed the limit. I had brought like $800 in cash, and someone had stolen it, maybe the German guy. This would be my last day and night there and that's all I had to do to get through it. I was famished. I sat on the beach, found a chair, and walked to a place to get pizza. I thought if I could just get some food in me, things would turn around. I ate the first slice and did feel a little bit better. Nearby, there were people playing volleyball on the beach. One of them struck the ball, and it landed directly on top of the pizza, knocking it out of my lap and into the sand. I tried to save a slice or two, but the sand was too overwhelming. The rest of the day and night, I slept on the beach, and I hate the beach. My phone was dead, and I wish I was at that point. I did eventually get home, but that was by far the worst chapter, series of days in my entire life. The psychedelic experience somehow seared itself into my brain, my very being. It took years to get over this experience. Now, it just seems like a series of absurd and terrible events that happened to someone else. Maybe someone will find some deeper truth in this and help them get through some of their worst experiences. And remember, your worst experiences don't define who you are. If you love this story and crave more tales of love, betrayal, and healing, don't forget to subscribe for more from Cheating Stories.